Thank you very much. It's a great honor to share a stage with, with so many uh, important and uh, good speakers. Um, I have been asked to speak first, not just because I've got to go away, but I uh, am not a terribly intelligent person. And so my understanding of cardi cardiology, and particularly heart rhythm problems, is a very simple one. Um, we as doctors have a real tendency to want to overcomplicate things. But the wonderful thing, wonderful thing about heart rhythm problems is that they are very, very straightforward and very simple. What I'm going to do uh, this morning is talk about what's safe and what's not. Um, arrhythmia mechanisms I'm not really going to touch on very much at all, um, but very briefly, and focus on the management of arrhythmia in primary care and drug treatment and also the interpretation of the 24-hour tape. But the fundamental thing I want to focus on is that dangerous arrhythmias, which is what everyone worries about, are either things that cause death or give a high risk of death. And it is very, very common for us to see referrals from primary care and see patients who are terrifically worried that their symptoms represent a potential heart attack. And of course it's not. They're, what they're really worried about is it representing a potential cardiac arrest. But if we boil down and think logically about the things that are dangerous, there are only two things that are dangerous. There are only two rhythm problems that are dangerous. VT or VF and complete heart block. And every single other rhythm problem has no prognostic significance at all. So bradycardia on a 24-hour tape at night, no significance. Ectopic beats, no significance. And these things have been looked at very, very carefully. And it's very clear that they do not have any prognostic significance. These are the only two things that put you at risk of early death. Sorry, this click is a little bit uh, unreliable sometimes. There we go. Um, so when you see patients who have symptoms, what are the things that then determine their risk of a future danger and primarily their risk of ventricular tachycardia or VF? So the things that worry us are if they have abnormal structure or heart function because that represents an abnormality of the heart muscle or the tissue which can lead to then heart rhythm problems. An abnormal ECG is almost always present in those patients. It is incredibly rare to see an abnormal echocardiogram or MRI in someone that's got a completely normal ECG. And similarly, the inherited rhythm problems like uh, long QT syndrome or Brigada, they're always associated or almost always associated with an abnormal ECG. The other thing that makes us worry is a family history of unexplained sudden death. So my brother or my uncle or my father all died in their 30s un unexplained. That, that would raise concerns. And the other thing that is always something that concerns me in the history is unexplained syncope. And by that I mean a sudden untriggered event, particularly if sitting down or lying down, um, a blackout, that always makes me concerned that there's something serious going on. As opposed to, uh, I stood up, I felt lightheaded, I fell over. <clears throat> so what do we do if the patient's not having symptoms? And this is a very common scenario. You know that by the t even if the patient comes to the surgery, with symptoms, by the time they come into your um, consulting room, their symptoms have gone. So how do we determine which patients are the ones at risk and which ones are the ones that you can reassure and investigate more carefully in the fullness of time? Well, the first thing is the ECG. <clears throat> and is it normal? And I'm being pretty non-specific about this because I don't expect people to be able to spot Brigada syndrome and I don't expect people to be able to spot rare <clears throat> early repolarization. But what, what I'm really saying is if you are looking at ECGs or asking someone to look at an ECG, if it doesn't look normal, then it's worth asking for further help and advice. And the other, thing that, the other symptom that worries me, as I've mentioned already, is a history of syncope. <clears throat> so if the patient is having symptoms during your consultation and during the ECG, there are only two things you need to know is, are they in complete heart block? 
And is the ECG got a narrow QRS complex? So if they have a tachycardia and it is narrow QRS complex, again, you know it cannot be VT. It obviously cannot be VF. So you've made a diagnosis of a benign rhythm problem. So again, we're boiling this down to is it VT or VF? Is it complete heart block? And everything else we don't need to worry about. It's a symptom lifestyle problem, not a life-threatening problem. <clears throat> and let me explain why this is. This is the normal conduction system. The heart's essentially a pump, a muscle pump, and like all pumps, it has an electrical controlling system. That electrical controlling system consists of a little group of cells at the top of the heart, the sinus node, which spontaneously depolarizes once every second and sends an electrical wave that washes through the cells, making them contract. When this electrical wave hits the junction between the atria and the ventricles, it stops because this is a fibrous ring that doesn't conduct electricity. Penetrating that fibrous ring is the AV node, which allows the electrical wave to conduct through very slowly because that gives the atria time to contract and pump blood into here before the electrical wave then rushes through this electrical motorway and causes the ventricle to contract. Now, the reason that you have this electrical motorway is because there's a lot of muscle bulk, there's a lot of cells to activate. And so you need this distribution system to make sure that this part of the heart activates at the same part of time as this part of the heart. You don't have this in the atria, so when you look at the ECG, the width, the time it takes for the atria, the P wave, to depolarize is the same as the QRS, the time it takes for the ventricle to depolarize, even though the voltages are very much different. So having a narrow QRS complex means that the ventricle must have activated through this Hispokinji system, so it must have come from the top of the heart. It must have been supraventricular in origin. So having a narrow QRS complex means it's safe, and having a broad QRS complex implies that it hasn't activated through this Hispokinji system and has probably originated in the ventricle and therefore is potentially ventricular in origin and ventricular tachycardia. So this is why if it's narrow, less than 120 milliseconds, you're fine. If it's broad, it's danger. And as I've mentioned earlier, the classical ECG shows a P wave, which is very much smaller than the QRS because the number of cells is much smaller. The width is very similar to the QRS because it takes just as long to activate the atria because it doesn't have this electrical motorway. And then you have a nice narrow QRS followed by the repolarization, the recharging of the cells in the ventricle. <clears throat> Maybe I should advance the slides before I started. There we go. And if a patient comes into your surgery with this tachycardia, the first thing that you will look at is the QRS. And again, you can see that the QRS is narrow in every single ECG lead. So you can just say, I don't have to worry about this anymore. This is an unpleasant, uncomfortable symptom that does not confer any prognostic significance at all. So I can then take my time and you know, talk to the patient and try and stop it with a Valsalva maneuver and then think about asking them to get a taxi up to the hospital to get them to stop it there. Not an ambulance, because it's not life-threatening. And indeed, um, while I'm trying to turn the slide over, uh, now we are running a, a trial in East London, uh, or in the whole of London, where the paramedics will um, uh, give adenosine at the back of the ambulance and then kick them out the back and not take them to hospital. And it's been very successful, and the patients love it because they don't have to come up to A&E. Um, However, this ECG does not look normal. So this is a patient that gives a history of palpitation, but they do not have the palpitation at the time you do the ECG. But when you look at the ECG, you can see it doesn't look right. There's this kind of wide QRS, and this is, um, I'm not expecting us to be specific about knowing the diagnosis, but this is a pre-excited ECG of someone that has Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And this is 
all I'm asking is that you recognize that this doesn't look normal and therefore the patient has potential risk of a prognostic problem. And indeed, with Wolf Parkinson White, they can develop this problem, which is atrial fibrillation, with very rapid conduction into the ventricles with this broad QRS, because the pathway, the accessory pathway, does not protect the ventricle in the same way as the AV node. So you know that the AV node, the normal connection between the atrium and the ventricle, has a rate limit on it. So if your atria goes into atrial fibrillation at 300 beats a minute, it will not conduct 300 beats a minute into the ventricle, whereas the accessory pathway does, and therefore can cause cardiac arrest and sudden death. However, when we come back to our basic principles, they still apply. So even if we don't remember the mechanisms of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and the ECG appearances, if, if it's an abnormal ECG, then they are at potential risk of sudden death and requires further consultation. Let's leave that behind now and talk about the most common benign rhythm problem that we're going to deal with. So I hope I've now reassured you about the risks of you know, what's dangerous and what's not. So let's talk about the most common benign rhythm problem, atrial fibrillation, affects 1% of the population, 10% of the population over 80, and the most worst consequence is stroke. And as you know, it's chaotic random activation in the, ven in the atria that then will transmit into the ventricle and produce a irregular and possibly fast uh, pulse. Can I get you to advance? There we go. And the ECG is of a narrow QRS, so we know we can relax, it's not dangerous. And then when we look at it a bit more closely, we can see that it's irregular. So this is an atrial fibrillation ECG. Um, so the, the common drugs that I would use for atrial fibrillation, and most, almost all of this can be done in primary care, is the first priority is to slow down the heart rate because that's the thing that makes people most uncomfortable and heart rate controlling drugs are very safe and you use them all the time for other things. So the beta blocker would be my first choice and in those that can't tolerate or can't take beta blocker, then a calcium channel blocker like Adizem or, or Verapamil. Digoxin, you see, appears very, very low down on the list because it's not really a useful drug for rate control. It's just an anomaly that in the UK we use digoxin. It's not used anywhere else in the world. And the reason for that is that digoxin works very well when the patient's sitting down doing nothing. But as soon as they get up and leave your office, their heart rate will shoot up because the digoxin doesn't work at reducing exercise-related heart rate. Now, if the patient still has symptoms despite good heart rate control, then we might decide to offer them rhythm control to try and reduce how much AF they're getting. And in that situation probably my first choice would be flecainide in patients that have no history of ca cardiac disease and have a normal ECG. And I would very, very, very rarely use amiodarone because of its long-term uh, side effects and risks. Huh? Yeah, I'm trying to get the slides. <laughs> Can we move the slides on? Because it's, it's slowing me up a little bit here. Um, so as I've said, rate control and anticoagulation. Causes of syncope? Well, um, there are some benign causes like this. So this is a patient with atrial fibrillation who then uh, essentially stops her atrial fibrillation, but her sinus node doesn't take over because she's quite old, and she has a blackout. Now this would make you, uh, if you saw this ECG, most people go, oh goodness me, this is worrying, I better get them up to hospital. But paradoxically, this is completely benign. So although the patient may fall over and break their hip, it's not going to actually, this isn't directly going to cause a prognostic problem because they've got sinus rhythm, they haven't got complete heart block. In contrast um, is this ECG where the patient's rate is much higher, but you can see that the P wave is unrelated to the QRS, so they have complete heart block, and although they're asymptomatic, they do have a prognostic problem. And this is why you can see that if you compare patients who have complete heart block, if you don't manage them with a pacemaker, they die much sooner than if you give them a permanent pacemaker. Here's the one that we worry about, a tachycardia, a broad QRS, it's VT. Um, I'm often asked by junior doctors, well, what about aberrant conduction, blah, 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 doesn't exist. So if you have a broad QRS and a tachycardia, it's VT. 
And the reason for that is that if you manage an SVT with aberrant conduction as VT, you won't, make a mis you won't do the patient any harm. Whereas if you manage a VT as though it was an SVT with aberrant conduction, you may cause problems. So we're coming to the final slide. What do I use a 24-hour tape for? Uh, I don't, is the answer. Um, the, the only time I might use a 24-hour tape is if I really want to assess someone's heart rate control. And the reason for this is logical. How often do patients get their symptoms every 24 hours? Virtually never. So the pickup rate from a 24-hour tape is completely useless. How many other things does a 24-hour tape show us? Nothing of significance. So bradycardia at night, secondary degree block in young fit people, of, of no significance at all, just triggers a referral. But actually it's of no prognostic significance. So if the patient's not getting symptoms during the tape, it is usually a completely useless um, uh, event. I will use seven-day halters to try and record an EC during, during symptoms, particularly if the patients have symptoms more than once a week. And uh, otherwise, um, if the patient's not symptomatic, the halter result is completely irrelevant. So, in conclusion, only complete heart block and VT and VF are of, of prognostic significance. So anything else you see on a halter is of not, no prognostic significance, but it may be significant to the patient if they were getting symptoms at the time you did the ECG, the ECG appearance occurred. Halters are really used to prove a diagnosis. They're not really used to make a diagnosis. So we already know what the patient's likely to have before we fit the halter. And what we're really trying to do is record the ECG during their symptoms to prove that. If the 12 lead is normal on their ECG, then any therapy they'll be given is for symptoms and lifestyle. It's not going to save their life. AF when patients with a risk of stroke is the only exception to this rule, of course, because for them, uh, if they're at high risk of stroke, then they are going to benefit by having anticoagulation to reduce their stroke risk. And again, you all know that aspirin is completely pointless in AF. It's not recommended by any guidelines now for anything. Thank you very much. Thank you.